The uh, writer Isaac Asimov wrote over 500 books. He uh, was a, a refugee, came to the United States as a three-year-old and grew up in poverty in Brooklyn, New York. And uh, uh, in one sense, you know, his books uh, encompass the entire universe from the, the impossibly ancient past to to the unimaginable future, uh, you know, that uh, 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 he saw all of history. He wrote about uh, things that had, that had happened people didn't know about, things that might happen, looked into the heart of the atom. Uh, in his books, he could go anywhere. However, he didn't like to leave his apartment in New York. He, he was kind of claustrophobic. About the only thing that could really get him to go out was, was three really great meals a day. So... One of the few things he would do, because he would almost never travel, was go on a cruise ship. Because number one, he'd get to talk, and number two, he'd get to eat. So that was fine. One time on a cruise ship in 1971, uh, there was, there was an individual who was giving a lecture, a science lecture, on video cassettes. You remember those. They used to make them. You put them in there. They, they, they were, they, they'd kind of lose the magnetic uh, tape, you know, they... They wouldn't record the stuff after a while. They'd finally snap and break, and you had to have that little box right next to your TV to rewind it before you took it back to the rental place. You remember rental places, right? Anyway, this man was talking about cassettes and how they could store information, and people could put the information on the TV, and they wouldn't have to read, and that books would be obsolete. And uh, uh, this was the wave of the future. You know, video cassettes would last forever which I don't remember them lasting forever. But anyway, uh, he had a lot of fun at Isaac Asimov's uh, expense saying, you're obsolete now. Nobody's ever going to read a book. Well, it turned out another speaker got sick from eating too much, so he was asked to give, Isaac Asimov was asked to give a, an extra lecture to all the people a couple days later. And he said, you know, I got to thinking about this idea of the cassettes. This is in an essay of his called The Ancient and the Ultimate. Uh, and... Uh, uh, he said, I, I see that you do have a point. And he said, now I can imagine some improvements. That uh, first of all, it's going to have to, you know, this, this, this cassette is going to have to be portable. That I can take it anywhere, to the beach, to the, to, to the room, on my vacation, to my office. It's going to have to be self-powered. We're going to have to find a way so that you won't have to plug it in. But you'll be able to use it wherever you find yourself. And that not only that... I will be able to use it and enjoy it without interfering with, with my neighbors and what cassette they're watching. And that, uh, uh, you know, not only will I be able to find my spot exactly and pick it up where I left off, but uh, that others will be able to use that same cassette at the same time and be able to pick up where they left off as well. And he began to describe the scientific marvel. Now, he, he, I actually kept the, his exact words here. You'll have to admit that such a cassette would be a perfect futuristic dream, self-contained, mobile, non-energy consuming, perfectly private, and largely under the control of the will. Ah, but dreams are cheap, so let's get practical. Can such a cassette possibly exist? To this, my answer is yes, of course. The next question is, how many years will we have to wait for such a deliciously perfect cassette? I have an answer for that, too and a quite definite one. We will have it in minus 5,000 years because what I have been describing is a book. <laughs> you know, the, there's a question about how do, we, how do we inscribe something? How do we write something down and make sure that it will still be there and be in use? Five years, 10 years, 5,000 years, 10,000 years. And especially if we feel that there's something important. You know, we look, we walk across the street to the cemetery, and we see that some of the tombstones, as permanent as they felt to those who installed them, are beginning to fade away, to wear away. We struggle to read the most basic information, the name, the date of birth, the date of death. 
and perhaps whatever else was inscribed on it. In Job, in, uh, in the book of Job, which is not this week's text, the author struggles. Job struggles because he feels he has a case that he will, you know, that, that he will not only be remembered as, as a sinner who deserves everything he gets, but that he'll be forgotten. Whereas he believes that he has done nothing to deserve his fate. And he laments, oh, that my words would be inscribed in a book or with, I, with, with, a, with an iron pen written on sheets of lead. Wondering what is the most per, per, permanent medium. Not being content merely with having it written down, but looking for something that will last, outlast an inscription upon a stone or scratching across a piece of paper. But then he says something, at least, that shows that regardless, there is one place, one place where our deepest desires can be inscribed and last forever. After my, this is the Hebrew, after my skin has been shredded, with my own eyes I shall see God, for I know that my Redeemer lives. Even more lasting than a book is knowing that your Redeemer lives and that your case has been written on the heart. And so Jeremiah speaks to a people who seeing their country fall apart, who find themselves led by leaders who don't understand them, who worry because there are empires pounding at the door. And Jeremiah writes to them in words that have survived 2,500 years so far. Pretty good. Pretty good. Saying that, that God plans, not only plans restoration, where we'll sow seeds and and we're not only just going to see corn and soybeans go up, but animals and people will spring from the earth because this will be such a fertile landscape that war and dictators and hatred cannot stop God's good will that we shall live in a blessed earth. But as he says, you know, I will create a new covenant. This is, this is where the word New Testament comes from. New Covenant, New Testament. I will write a new covenant, and just to make sure that you know it, it will be written on your heart. So you won't need to be taught, but you will know within your inmost being what is right and what is good and what is God's will. The ancient and the ultimate. A book's a pretty good way to keep what is written safe for the future. But God has chosen an even more permanent medium. The goodness of your hearts. For every disheartening story we see on the news, if we take time to look around, we see an even better story acted out by our children and grandchildren, by the good people with whom we share this church, and by the ordinary person we meet by chance or design on the street. There is incredible good going on, and Jeremiah wanted us to remember. Not only that, God intends to intervene and to remember our sins no more. How will that work? That's where Jesus begins to talk through this parable. You know, he's been talking about the coming of the kingdom, about God intervening on the earth, but now he wants us to know what's happening now. And so he tells a parable. The word parable means it's a geometric figure in which something goes way out like a boomerang, but it manages to come right back to us. In his time, a judge was both judge and jury. 
You look for a judge, tried to get a judge, an arbitrator to hear your case, and then you had to live by it. And judges could choose whatever case they wanted or no cases at all. And there was nothing to prevent them from simply supporting their friends and seeing who looked out for their interests. Why should a judge take a case from an impoverished widow who is a non-person in the society? If this, is a, if this woman is a widow, she doesn't exist. She's dependent upon charity. If she has a legal case, no one will stand up for her. This is something that people knew all about in Jesus' day. So he says this certain judge doesn't fear God and doesn't care about people, does not respect people. Perhaps he's not even a believer. But this widow, day and night, is present, begging for him to hear the case. I think the first listeners laughed. If you listen to me tell the parable from the scripture, this is a pretty funny situation. This is a person who is rich and insulated and has no reason to listen to anybody, and yet Jesus says this widow is there wherever he goes. If he's going to a meal with his friends, she will be there. If he's getting anywhere near the court, she will be there. If, she, if he's going to the men's club, she will be there. Wherever it is, we're to see her as an inordinate pest. And he finally says, and I like the way Jesus puts this, all right, I don't fear God. All right, I don't respect people. But she has worn him down. And he will hear her case. And I'm just guessing but he'll probably rule in her favor to get her off his back. Jesus says, now if unjust people, if you fight City Hall, if you write ten letters in a row, if you complain about the treatment you got on the airline or in the restaurant or with a certain product, if people make phones that blow up and finally say, all right, maybe it was my fault. If these things happen in our world... And humans respond, don't you think God is listening to your prayers? Don't give up. Keep on praying. Why are we so faithless as to think that we tried prayer, it didn't work, as if we knew God's timetable better than he does? If we were willing as a child to ask over and over again for something, why are we finally surprised on Christmas morning when we finally get the Red Ryder BB gun that you weren't going to get because you chewed your eye out with that thing? I think that's the next show at Amish Acres, you know, the, the musical version of uh, Christmas Story. But, but I can't, you know... If you can get the Red Ryder BB gun, God will not forget that we need justice on this earth, that we need the girls who were kidnapped to be released, that we need an end to war and suffering and food upon the table of the hungry. Of course, sometimes we have to make our prayers happen, as in the case from that story I told you earlier, if not higher. Sometimes that's God's plan, but that's okay too because as Jeremiah told us, the new covenant is written right here. And I don't know about you, but if I fail to do something that I know I really should have done, that word that is written on my heart can keep me awake. Just as we work out to make our muscles stronger, as we listen to prayers of others, that new covenant gets stronger within our hearts. You know, the book of Jonah ends with a question, which is a great way to end a book. You know, when Jonah complains that God did not destroy the Assyrians like they deserved in a, you know, leaving the city of Nineveh a smoking ruin, God says, You cared about a bush that 
lived and died in a day and you had nothing to do with, and shouldn't I care about 144,000 Ninevites who don't know their right hand from their left, and if not them, hundreds of thousands of cattle who aren't guilty of anything? And so this parable ends with another question that invites us to answer as well. You know, we just learned that an unjust judge will finally listen if pestered enough and embarrassed enough and spotlighted enough. And that we are called to pray without ceasing. And then it says, but when the Son of Man is coming into the earth, will he find faith upon the earth? Will he find people that are praying without ceasing, who are acting because of their prayers, who care enough to keep people centered in their hearts? What will the Son of Man find when he comes? And how will you answer? I invite you now for a moment to think about how you've been answering. I can only... I can only kick myself for what I've failed to do. It's up to you to look into your hearts and answer as well. Is there a prayer you need to look to as soon as you leave here today, a prayer that you can answer for somebody else? Is there, is there a prayer that needs to be raised to God that you, you fear weary because you have lifted it before? Well, the more you lift it up, the stronger you will be. Is there something you've given up on that perhaps you need to pick up once more and give another shot? Have you lost faith in God's ability to be ruler of the universe? Because you didn't get something this Christmas with another Christmas, another coming of the Lord, another nativity and birth of Jesus on the way. I invite you now, if you wish, to come up here with me, if you feel led, to pray together for God to write upon our hearts once more the new covenant, to write upon our hearts the gospel that is life itself. If you feel the need for that new covenant to come alive. Take a moment now and come up and pray as you are able for it to come to life.